Of note was Matt's 2013 column for Rotor Magazine, wondering why more helicopter pilots facing deteriorating flight conditions don't take advantage of their aircraft's unique ability to land anywhere. The resulting safety initiative, Land and Live, has been adopted by groups around the world, reminding pilots that sometimes the safest thing to do is, quote, in his words, land the damn helicopter. Um, and, and in recent events, uh, it is brought to light. This is exactly the kind of straightforwardness we need in this industry, and we appreciate Matt's dedication and posthumously, I want to thank him uh, for all of his efforts um, in this industry, for helicopters, for drones at this committee. Um, we're saddened by the loss, um, but we were enriched by his participation in all these years. Michael. I think he's someone whose presence is going to be missed by, by this group, uh, his friends and family, but by, by the industry overall. So with that, I, I ask that we might just take a moment of silence and wish him and his family well. I want to make sure I'm doing the right order here. Is, is uh, DFO remarks or Michael's introduction? We're now up to Michael's remarks. Hello. Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Chasen. I'm the uh, chairman of the Drone Advisory Committee. I would like to welcome uh, all of you who are joining us for this meeting, both here in this room and who are watching uh, online to uh, this gathering of uh, industry leaders and particularly um, the people at the FAA who are working together with people now in the industry to help bring all various initiatives to help make drones more successful. Uh, when I, when I took on this role uh, not more than six months ago, I talked about that there were two large things that really needed to happen to help move this industry forward. First of all, the technology needed to be able to be developed, and that's being done through uh, both government initiatives and private initiatives, and quite frankly, a lot of times the government working closely with private industry. But at the same time, in a parallel path, there needed to be put in place those policies that were able to support all the use cases we were thinking of today, but at the same time have the foresight to identify that this is a rapidly changing industry and we need to make sure the policies didn't hold back all the new innovation that we knew was right around the corner. So to that end, I identified five key priorities that I wanted this group to focus on at the beginning of my term. Identifying remote ID, beyond visual line of sight, counter UAS, improving the waiver process, and also having the, the government work even more closely with private industry to, as a group, move this industry together. And we've made significant progress in just a short time on many of these various initiatives. And today, we're going to continue to move forward on a few of these top priorities. But one of the things that I'm most excited about, and that shows that this isn't just a one-way communication, is that, as you see, is a large part of today's agenda. We're going to be hearing feedback from the FAA on their responses from the previously submitted DAC recommendations around um, uh, uh, the early remote ID, the UAS security issues, as well as improvements to the Part 107 waiver process. These are different initiatives that people around this table and in the industry have all contributed to, and now we've been able to bring to the table in the forefront of the FAA, and we're going to hear from them their feedback to the recommendations that we as a group have made and what we're now, as a combined organization, going to be able to move forward on. In addition, in this meeting, we're going to start to talk about some new focus areas. We're going to talk about extending the UTM group and also uh, putting together some initiatives around creating a safety culture. Now, lastly, uh, as we've noted, there have been a few vacancies around uh, the table, and we want to make sure that we are, uh, have a group that can not only successfully move forward on these various initiatives, but that we have a group that's very representative of the entire industry. And so shortly, the DOT will be issuing a solicitation for DAC membership. Uh, the, we want to maintain the committee membership uh, uh, targeted number of 35 members, but we want to make sure that we have a pool of qualified candidates for future vacancies and seek to look for underrepresented sectors of the drone community. 
So we're going to be putting out, uh, the DOT will be putting out uh, that solicitation shortly. So I encourage everyone in this room who may have other individuals or organizations that they think could be helpful to the DAC, and those of you online that are interested, to look for that solicitation and uh, put forward an application so we can make sure that the DAC is running not only at the, the full speed of making sure that all 35 members are represented here, but that we have the great insight from across what I think is one of the most innovative industries uh, moving forward with new technology today. So with that, let me uh, hand it back over to the, uh, the committee. Thank you. So at this time, we'd like to have um, Alexandra uh, join us for the review of the, the um, FACA overview. Mm -hmm. Good morning, and thank you for your time this morning. As noted, I'm Alexandra Randazzo, and I'm the managing attorney with the Litigation and Information Law Division with the Office of the Chief Counsel. Oops, thank you. <laughs> As I uh, noted, I'm a managing attorney with the information in the Litigation and General Law Division, Information Law Practice. That office focuses on providing legal advice on various information law topics, such as the Freedom of Information Act, as well as the Federal Advisory Committee Act. Um, since the Joan Advisory Committee is established in accordance with FACA by the Secretary of Transportation, in my role in that office, I'm here to provide you an overview of important aspects of the law as you operate as members of this, uh, the Joan Advisory Committee. Moving on to the next slide, which I think, uh, here we go. Uh, as noted here, I think some important facts, and I think you, uh, has already been noted, FACA governs the DAC activities. It means that the, as noted by the Federal Advisory Committee Act, uh, the role of the Joan Advisory Committee is just that to be advisory to the FAA. Um, FACA also provides that Congress and the public must be kept informed of the advisory committee's purpose, membership, activities, and cost. FACA sets forth some requirements with regards to procedures such as charters, uh, publications of notices, membership, different aspects that I will cover in the next few slides. Going on to the next slide, a couple of notes here that I'd like to point out. As mentioned, uh, the DAC is a discretionary advisory committee, and in accordance to the law, uh, a charter setting forth the objectives, the duties, the membership was filed with the Library of Congress and the appropriate oversight committees. This needed to be done before the DAC could operate, and this charter is publicly available. In addition, the appropriate Federal Register notices were made available regarding its establishment and will be required upon renewal after two years of its establishment. Moving on to meetings. As required by law, 15 calendar days before this meeting, as mentioned before, Federal Register notice was posted explaining the date, time, and place and purpose of the meeting. It likewise provided a summary of the agenda which was approved by the DAC's designated federal officer. The goal is to provide the public notice of the intent of the meeting so that they may make an informed decision whether to request to attend the meeting and or provide written statements or requests to speak at this meeting. The law also provides that generally FACA meetings will be open to the public, as this one, unless there's a determination to close or partially close that meeting in accordance with the law. If such determination had been made, there would have been a public notice with the Federal Register notice that was published. Going on to records and meetings. As noted, at the conclusion of this meeting, the uh, minutes of the meeting will be prepared and made available to the public, which will include, among other items, content, the list of those individuals who have attended, descriptions of the matters that have been discussed, including any oral statements and or written statements that have been provided. 
The chair is responsible for certifying the accuracy of those meetings. Note that FACA requires that FACA, FAC, Federal Advisory Committees, reports, transcripts, minutes, appendices, working papers, studies, agendas, or other documents which may, were made available to or prepared for or by the Federal Advisory Committee be made publicly available unless they're subject to the Freedom of Information Act exemption. Lastly, I know for the last no, uh, bullet here is that the records of the Drone Advisory Committee are managed in accordance to the NARA record schedule of 6.2 which for the most part, if you were to look at it, provides permanent retention of the records of this drone advisory committee. On this slide, I really don't have much to say. I'll just note that, of course, as members of the DAC, you were appointed by the Secretary of Transportation after the appropriate ethics review was completed. Now, as members of the Drone Advisory Committee, your responsibility is to report reports with recommendations based on the taskings that the FAA provides to you. You are expected to attend all meetings and to extend your speaking to others. It is in your personal capacity, not for the DAC as a whole. I'd like to note on this last minute, I want to share some guidance relating to the handling of confidential business or personal information. I understand that sharing information is vital uh, part of ensuring committee's uh, success in completing assigned tasks. However, please keep in mind the following when deciding what to share. Unless prior approval is received through the Secretary of Transportation, the Dr uh, Drone Advisory Committee should not receive, compile, or discuss data or reports concerning matters which would be covered by what are known as Exemption 4 and 6 of the Freedom of Information Act, which basically deal respectively with records that are trade secrets and or commercial and financial information, and records that the release of which would constitute a clearly unwarranted invasion of personal privacy. The last note, if ultimately there is a determination that information can be shared to the FAA after the proper coordination with the secretary has been uh, provided, that those type of records be properly marked before they are provided to the FAA. A final word on uh, subcommittees. And this is, uh, to the extent the DAC determines, and, I, and my understanding it is, uh, some subcommittees or any groups are established there under. It's important for those groups to provide their work to the Drone Advisory Committee, the parent committee in this particular case. Uh, the DAC will be the one who will actually deliberate those reports that are pro provided by the subcommittees or the working groups in a public meeting as this one. Um, so it's important for any working group that is established under the Drone Advisory Committee always provide their recommendations directly to the parent for that deliberation. Is, now that wraps up my presentation for you today. Um, I hope it has provided you a good insight of how the Federal Advisory Committee Act uh, operates and governs this, the operations of the Drone Advisory Committee. If you have any questions, I'm here to take them. If not, this concludes my presentation. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Before we proceed, can I go ahead and have a motion to accept the minutes from our prior meeting? So moved. So moved, second. Okay, any opposed? Terrific, those uh, minutes are then passed. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Jay Merkel, and I will start the section where the FAA is responding to the first three taskings that we received from the DAC. So we received these taskings at the last DAC meeting, and we committed to giving you a response uh, to the taskings at this meeting. And so I have the responsibility to brief you out on DAC tasking number one, the early equipage in accordance with the ASTM standard. 
So the, the task group recognized, or excuse me, we the FAA, in our response, divided our response into two time, into three time frames in which we could say slightly different things about the response. The first period, which is uh, starts when an industry consensus remote ID standard is published and ends when the FAA's remote ID rule is final. So we are currently in that. ASTM published their standard on February 19th, and that's very good news to all of us in the industry. So we're currently in period one. Period two starts when the FAA's remote ID rule is final. Remember, we just have a notice of proposed rulemaking and the comment period ends March 4th, and I encourage everyone to continue to comment. Um, but when the FAA's remote ID rule is final and the service supplier network is established, but prior to the FAA's formal acceptance of a means of compliance for remote ID, and the third period starts when the FAA has accepted a standard to comply with remote ID and ends when the required operational compliance date with the rule uh, comes into uh, being. So really, period. these are all periods up until the time uh, compliance is required with the rule. Next slide, please. The first DAC, first DAC recommendation was the ASTM remote ID standard um, as the equipage basis for the voluntary program. And the FAA's response is we acknowledge the DAC's consensus agreement to recommend the pending and now uh, published ASTM remote identification standard as the basis for any voluntary equipage incentives and welcome the DAC's layered approach to incentivizing as described in your recommendation. Uh, next, please. So this next one we have that's uh, very compounded, your recommendations, so we're going to take these item by item. Uh, the DAC recommended incentives regarding waiver applications, processing requirements, contract preference, equipment, acknowledgement, airspace access, rebates, and monetary incentives. And we will address each of those individually. For waiver application processing and requirements, the FAA commits to conducting a gap analysis of any uh, remote ID industry consensus published during standard published during period one and communicating to manufacturers and operators any information part 107 waiver applications would need to provide in order for the FAA to give credit to using the remote ID as a risk mitigation in waiver applications. I'm just going to pause for any questions from the DAC because there's a lot packed in there. Hey, Jay, uh, would you mind elaborating, uh, when, when would you anticipate, when would the FAA anticipate uh, that process beginning? You mean, are, just in Houston, terms of, Houston can, yeah, which process? Just uh, in what, terms what of. What date are you looking for? <laughs> well, just, you're talking about the published period during period one of the consensus standard. Are we pretty close to that standard and that process beginning, or just from a time frame, what would you see that? You know, starting to take so now that we have the published standard, we'll begin the gap analysis um, very shortly so that if people are manufacturing and or operating to the remote ID standard, we can have that information out there. So we're actually starting that process now. Excellent. Thank you. Um, contract preference. In order to be fair and equitable, it's highly unlikely that the FAA's procurement processes would enable preferential treatment for voluntary early adoption of equipage or compliance to regulations. Now, that being said, if the FAA writes in a requirement, um, we may actually value the uh, use of early equipage if we had a contract and needed that as a requirement. But we would not deviate from our acquisition management system standard, which is full and open competition unless otherwise justified. Okay. Equipage acknowledgement. The FAA will maintain an online database of manufacturers who have declared compliance with the industry consensus standard recognized by the FAA as a means of compliance with the remote ID rule. 
we will begin this database with the first declaration of compliance. So remember the way the proposal is in the rule is there will be a, someone will have to have a means of compliance, the means of compliance will have to be accepted, and then a manufacturer would declare that they meet that means of compliance. Okay, FAA response on airspace access. The FAA commits to working with our federal security partners to determine whether an expected um, process for FAA compliant aircraft could be established in order to approve airspace access for certain UAS in certain circumstances. So in other words, where uh, it might be advantageous to have remote ID both for the operator and for the security partners. Additionally, we will find, we'll add a field to our SGI form, which is used um, for access to this airspace, for indication of remote ID compliant aircraft. This will make it easy for our folks looking at this information to determine whether you're meeting that requirement, uh, which could facilitate coordination with incident commanders and security partners in certain circumstances. Okay. I'm pausing. Yes. Joe. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, Joe DePedalpa. I <clears throat> just had a question regarding um, not uh, accounting for the early uh, implementation of remote ID in terms of any preferential treatment. Is that, what's the logic behind, behind that? Could you describe what you mean by preferential treatment? Could you go back, just go back yeah. a slide and let me just look at that, I'm sorry. Uh, that contract preference yes. in order to be fair and equitable. Can you just elaborate on that a little bit so I understand that? So uh, the FAA Jay, is procurement. Pardon? Let me jump sure. in here. Um, <clears throat> morning, we, morning, talked yeah. about, we talked about this uh, the other day, Joe. Um, and, and Arjun can step in here if I go into, tread into legal areas. But bottom line is you can't require something that's not yet final, right? Let me see. Um, however, we are talking about voluntary right. uh, remote ID. Right. So if the contractual requirement is enhanced by remote ID and the applicant shows that they have it, then an applicant that has it versus one who doesn't in the process of the consideration will, will, will be in a, in a higher plane. Understood. But not on an official you right. know, basis Understood. because it isn't yet. Perfect. Affordable. Thank you. Great, boss. Okay, rebates or monetary incentives. The FAA commits to considering this option as, uh, as an incentive for early remote ID compliance and equipage for a fixed period of time and a specific number of UAS, but would need additional input from manufacturers in, in, in order to determine the best window to make this offer. And remember, in the remote ID rule, we have... Uh, proposed a three-year compliance period. So this would be a very compressed time frame um, relative to what some may be creating the analogy to, which is the ADSB rule and the incentivized equipage. Remember, that was a 10-year compliance time. So this is greatly compressed in, uh, in, refer in um, reference to that. So uh, I believe it's one more slide. I think that was my last portion of the response. Put forward. One more? Please go forward then. Uh, oh, it's up. Thank you. Um, the DAC recommended incentives. Uh, okay, this is our, we strongly encourage states and municipalities to favorably consider remote ID equipped aircraft when establishing their restrictions and conditions. And we commit to undertaking an educational campaign for states, cities, municipalities specifically related to the benefits of remote ID provides in terms of situation awareness for their law enforcement and public safety commit officials. The FAA recognizes that while this may not be a direct incentive for individual operators and recreational flyers, it should broadly incentivize the UAS manufacturing community to produce aircraft in compliance with the published standard, industry consensus standard, um, for example, the serial number standard, as early and as quickly as possible. 
The FAA is fi finally commits to reconsider the DAX recommendation as well as any additional ideas to incentivize voluntary remote ID equipage as we get closer to finalizing the rule. In other words, we have, um, well, as of this morning, we had over 30,000 comments against the rule. And so uh, I imagine that's a very rich environment for uh, new proposals to modify the policy. So as we understand that better and work with the DAC, uh, we would continue to investigate new ways to incentivize early equipage. So questions? Okay, with that we move on. Uh, Mr. Chairman and DFO, would you like to continue moving forward or take a break? Okay. So uh, now DAC tasking number two, please. Elizabeth Soltis. Good morning. Uh, the tasking identified for task order number two was to identify uh, what currently existing or near-term solutions would be available for clueless and careless operators um, in order to help us with our safety acumen. Further, we also asked um, the DAC to identify what is the universe of actions if relevant industry stakeholders agreed to them would substantially reduce the likelihood of unintentional threatening behavior. The DAC um, analyzed this and came up with many scenarios, five in particular, looking at airspace, looking at aircraft, and looking at the operator. And across what they referred to as their three pillars, they ran scenarios looking at TFRs, airspace in and around airports, temporary flight restrictions, mass gatherings in the vicinity of other aircraft which were manned, and looking at compliant UAS that were appropriately flying in that environment. Next slide, slide one. So the recommendation number one was that OEM should fly their UAS with geofencing capabilities. And as you know, on December 31st, FAA and DOT released our remote ID rule with a comment period through March 2nd. Geofencing is in fact reflected in the rule and as part of the notice of proposed rulemaking, the FAA envisions this requirement can be met through geofencing as one capability. We also discuss command and control power limitations. But the FAA, in our notice of proposed rulemaking, does not propose to impose any range limitations on standard remote ID UAS. We look and discuss more sophisticated capabilities, such as airspace prohibitions, temporary flight restrictions. We also discuss public safety drone missions that would be afforded access to airspace. We also discuss part-time prohibitions. Of note, current law prohibits from enforcing FAA statutes by state and local, i.e. preemption. Local law enforcement does have tools in the toolbox. State and locals have enforcement capability affiliated with voyeurism. They also have the ability to manage land, departure, and arrival locations. Slide two, please. The next DAC recommendation was that federal government should make available a consolidated, standardized, and up-to-date database for critical infrastructure and temporary flight restrictions issued that are machine possible. Uh, sorry about that. And the FAA does, in fact, already provide lands our low altitude authorization and notification capability, which came online as a beta test in April of 2018, 
And to date, there's approximately 600 airspaces with 400 air traffic controllers managing to that. Um, if you go to the FAA online, we have we promote LANS capability, and there are active LANS service providers, approximately nine, that handle Part 107 almost just-in-time information, as well as longer analysis. Further, LANS has been upgraded to handle recreational flyers. In addition, we offer notice to airmen, and we are currently working on our aeronautical information service to enhance the notice to airmen capabilities with some modernization capabilities. In our FAA Extension Safety and Security Act of 2016, the Secretary of Transportation was asked to, um, to manage a rule to prohibit or restrict access to a specific airspace, and it was well de defined what those fixed uh, site facilities would be. 2209 is in the rulemaking process. It has not been released yet. So as an interim solution, the FAA is employing our current authorities under 14 CFR 99.7. This affords us special security instructions so that our federal security partners can, in fact, use temporary flight restrictions in and around federal prisons, um, around military bases, even environments that are uh, managed or requested by our security partners, such as the Super Bowl. Slide number three, please. The DAC also requested that OEM should create alerts for UAS operators when their UAS is approaching sensitive facilities, such as controlled airspace, prohibited flight areas, and temporary flight restrictions, et cetera. The FA-6 supports this expedited development and fielding of this automation capability. We support this functionality in the future to also include 4D trajectory as our UAS unmanned traffic management systems expand. Next slide, pl slide, please. Number five, the OEMs should voluntarily equip ADSB in receivers on UAS systems. In other words, airframes and or controller combined with notification systems in recommendation number two above. A follow on this would be voluntary equipage of an air for, airborne conflict resolution collision avoidance capability for UAS operators. And again, I repeat that on December 31st, 2019, the FAA and Department of Transportation um, issued our notice of proposed rulemaking. All formal comments are being accepted through March 2nd. FAA does in fact address ADSB in our notice of proposed rulemaking. We evaluated and discussed in the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking that ADSB um, is an area that we are not considering in this rule. It's, it's not that we're not considering at this juncture. We think it may not be appropriate. And we looked at spectrum analysis and air traffic uh, capabilities in that airspace, found that we would have saturation and that we did not have the current infrastructure that would man be able to manage uh, this type of capability. The FAA, in our Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, proposes to address the identification issues associated with UAS, requiring the use of new services, as identified, again, in the NPRM. Slide five, please. Yes, I can. Can you hear, can you hear me? So um, thanks. I'm, this is my first DAC meeting, so I wasn't available to hear the, uh, the previous recommendation. But I read the recommendation as... as advocating for ADSB in, in quotes, meaning an ADSB receiver on the drone as a means to avoid a manned aircraft that is equipped with ADSB out. Your response is based on the assumption that the rec recommendation is based on ADSB out on the drone and therefore the manned aircraft could respond. So yes, the NPRM does address ADSB out as uh, not an appropriate means of remote identification. It addresses the ADSB out function as not appropriate for Part 107, uh, and it addresses ADSB out as uh, on uh, UAS operating under Part 91. It does not address any sort of recommendation at all on the use of ADSB in, as in a receiver, as a means to avoid manned aircraft. And it feels just reading through the text that there was a maybe a misunderstanding in the recommendation, but maybe someone who was on that task could clarify. 
So uh, first of all, let me respond with this is my first deck as well. And uh, secondly, you are correct that, um, and I know, Jay, you're, you're here as well with what's in the RID, and, and um, we have some other folks in the audience. But in general, and, and perhaps I shouldn't have provided so much context here, ADSB is discussed in the rule, and the comments affiliated with ADSB um, you know, are being received through March 2nd. And I, let me just clarify then what you're saying is that you only wanted to discuss ADSB in. That's the way I read this recommendation is that there, there's no spectrum utilization for ADSBN, correct? So there, I read the recommendation, the text, as recommending for ADSB as a, a means for detect and avoid passively. And, that, that, and, and the response seems to be um, the opposite. So, so, Christian, I think in the elaboration of the response, we focused a little bit more on the rule and the ADSB out, but you are correct. Um, the the recommendation was for ADSB in, and the FA is actively working with multiple applicants on uses of ADSB in. But I'm not seeing a statement here that the FAA, um, uh, there's no recommendation here for ADSB in as a we'll, means for. We'll go back and right. relook at that. But we are actively um, working with applicants on the use of ADSB in. Thank you. And just to add to that, so. thanks, Jay. Appreciate that comment. And Christian, your comments as well reflect mine. I think it's helpful just to note for the DAC and for the FAA that there are many active engagements and research efforts on detect and avoid, um, in particular using ADSB in on the UAS so it doesn't create spectrum issues. And I just think for awareness of the committee, um, there are actually many organizations, I can see several around the table, that are working on this effort. Uh, it would be helpful to know from the FAA if that momentum and effort is well aligned and in the direction that. FAC is as effective, um, either now or at a later stage? Um, well, without revealing who the applicants are, because uh, that's uh, uh, private information, uh, they are all consistent, and they are all mo working towards moving uh, to various ways to do detect and avoid. And we see good consensus around all the approaches. It's our understanding that some of those companies are, in fact, talking with each other on commonizing or making the approach more common. Um, and we strongly encourage that as well. But we're seeing good progress uh, in terms of defining what might be possible with ADSB in. And we're supportive of the data collection efforts that people are suggesting and very much looking forward to the results because the results of these efforts could give us another very powerful tool in the layered risk mitigation toolbox, particularly in uh, the Mode C veil. Great, thank you, Jay. Slide five, please. The OEMs should explore the voluntary enablement of automated UAS flight performance limitations, such as altitude limitations, return to home features, and decrease of UAS speed or maneuverability while in or near sensitive flight areas. The FAA does, in fact, support the development and integration by industry in cooperation with the FAA for automated UAS flight performance limitations linked to the proximity of airspace restrictions and other similar areas. But we do note that the development of any such automation which significantly alters a UAS flight performance and behavior must be closely coordinated with the FAA to address potential safety and security implications. Next slide, please. OEMs should explore the voluntary development and equipage of UAS with performance-based detect and avoid technology, which I think we just explored a moment ago, and collision obstacle avoidance on the airframe using acoustic obstacle and or other sensors as well as robust detect and avoid algorithms. Again, the FAA supports this 
and we also, again, would expect close coordination with the FAA to ensure safety and security um, implications are worked through. Is there anything, um, any questions before I depart? I have a quick question. Um, actually, more of a comment than anything else. Uh, Greg Agment with CNN. As an operator uh, who's flying virtually every day in the U.S. Uh, airspace, I want to give a little bit of a reality check to your slide number two, uh, which had to do with the federal government should make des uh, available consolidated and standardized uh, information. It's our um, uh, experience that uh, we see, we, we witness every day missing or disparate information from a number of different sources, whether it's interactive maps provided by the FAA, uh, facility maps, vector maps, LANCE, information provided by the U.S. Uh, S providers, or even from manufacturers. So I do think that uh, while, while your response is that you offer this, I think there's a lot of work that still needs to be done in rectifying some of the disparate and missing information. And that's from an operator uh, we witness it every day. Yeah, um, Greg, good comment. And that's actually where that AIS effort is focused, is to do a better job of pulling all of that data together. So that's where the AIS links in with your comment. Thank you. Okay, response to tasking number three, Rico. Thanks for the uh, for the opportunity to, to talk to the deck. This is my first rodeo, so go gently with me, please. Um, we, um, as you folks um, know, you uh, gave us some recommendations on the 107 waiver, and I'd like to quickly go over those just to to uh, tell you where we are in the process. I know it's a uh, a lot of people would consider it to be a, a slow and onerous process, and we are slowly trying to, to, to expedite, streamline, et cetera, and so forth, the waiver process. So if you bear with me. So we'll go to the first one. Um, DAC rec recommendation to auto renewal on the expiring waivers. Expiring waivers should auto renew unless there is a compliance issue or change in the regulation. If not able to auto renew, only require entry of renewed dates, not re-entry of the entire waiver um, process. FAA is currently planning an expedited Part 107 waiver renewal application process in Drone Zone. So we've had a little, we, we can't auto, auto renew exactly, but what we're trying to do is trying to make the process a little easier for folks to, to, uh, to, to get through the process without, without having to continuously do the entire application. We'll reduce the reapplication burden for waiver renewals for applicants where the residual operational risk regulatory structure and policy has not changed since the original waiver issuance. So again, we're just trying to expedite that. The schedule will be announced at the UAS Symposium June 2020. It looks like a 2020-2021 uh, implementation. Next one is to modify a drone zone. Allow the operator to update non-consequential waiver application information and forego filing and amendment. Examples like uh, change responsible person and office address, kind of an administrative type, type things. Um, FA and responsible person are obligated to ensure all pertinent data in a waiver application and issued waiver are accurate and up to date. We, we got to continuously keep this stuff up to date and we've learned some, some of this from other um, applications, not only to UAS but other things like the registry. So process in place for changing of information on an issued waiver such as uh, responsible person or addresses. Checklist of safety cases for complex waiver approvals. Um, the FAA should create a checklist of successful safety cases involving complex waiver approvals like EVLOS, multi-ship, et cetera. The FAA should consider creating a testing procedure for Part 21, 41, and, uh, and the like that should be graduated. Provide online tests and guidelines for automatic waiver approvals. 
So the FAA has published examples of approved safety cases for each regulation waiver online as required by Section 352. We also, we are developing a risk tool to assess the applicants in identifying and reducing UAS operational risks, which should help with the application, we're hoping. Disapproved waiver applicants may con contact the UAS Support Center, which may provide additional insight on deficiencies in disapproved waiver applications. So we have that open to, to folks, and maybe we're not um, putting uh, on enough emphasis on that, that folks can kind of call in, and then they can take a look at that and ask questions to our analysis so that the um, folks that are trying to apply can, can, can help with their application. And we, maybe we need to do a better job of uh, advertising that, so we're going to be working on that. The FAA is updating disapproval letters to provide more constructive feedback. So maybe there's not a checklist per se, but we're still trying to provide more feedback to the folks. So the letter will have that feedback. Also, again, we'll advertise to be, for those folks to be able to contact us to ask, hey, what can I do better to get this application approved? The deck, next deck recommendation, consider a streamlined automated approval for applicants. FAA should leverage the work of programs in UAST top and industry standards and give operators credit for undergoing audits, certification, and other training beyond Part 107 compliance. The FAA is required to review each waiver application submitted. For sure we got to do that. The FAA recognizes the potential of safety benefits, specialized experience, advanced training programs, and industry audits and they can provide currently sponsoring research projects to identify and quantify the appropriate amount of mitigation credit for specialized experience and advanced training. So we're trying to incorporate some of that, and we're continuing to do so as we move forward. So as again, I said slowly, but it, we, we're certainly taking advantage of, the, of some of those uh, mitigations. FAA will collaborate with industry to leverage the research outcomes to develop publicly available guidelines for training, training programs, and specialized experience. There's that word again, streamlined. Consider a streamlined process for groups of operators applying for waivers of the same type of operations for business use case. Again, we're, we're, we're desperately trying to streamline some of this, uh, this uh, as well because from our side of the house, we, we would we would love to streamline uh, and and um, and help the applicant to 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 get to make it a better process so that that makes them more comfortable and easy to operate. FAA is currently exploring and modifying the drone zone application formats to streamline streamline the application, streamline the receipt, streamline the analysis of waiver applications, make it a quicker, better, more efficient operation. For Part 107 waivers, changes will begin uh, implemented in calendar year 2020 and into 2021, as I said previously. The FAA is continuously evaluating strategy and methods to facilitate improvement in our process. Increase transparency and accountability of Part 107 an analysts by creating a pathway for applicants to learn who reviewed their application and why it was not approved. FAA waiver analysts can act as risk acceptors. We all know that. All risk acceptance occurs at the AFS 800 branch. Those folks, they work for me, so we're, we're, uh, we're attempting to, to make that happen from a division manager level or above for Part 107 waivers. So it's, it's right up there in, in the, uh, in the uh, management level. The FAA has improved transparency of processes by creating an open line of communication between the UAS Support Center and Waiver and Al Analysts. Support Center serves as the primary point of contact and information pathway for applicants who seek explanation or guidance re regarding waivers. And again, I don't, I don't think we've advertised that well enough, so we're going to attempt to, to advertise that, that portal for folks to be able to do that. Require Part 107 waiver inspectors to attend structured programs similar to that mandated by AIR 900 Enterprise Operations Division Program that provides FAA, ASIs, and UAS designated airworthiness representatives the background, key policies, and procedures. So all, all waiver analysts are certified and, and accredited aviation safety inspectors, and they're trained in the waiver process. 
Additionally, inspectors assigned to the waiver team receive additional Part 107 specific waiver training, Part 107 waiver analysis, Part 107 risk recommendation standardization, Part 107 waiver quality control processes, ongoing Part 107 waiver agency subject matter experts engagement and education based on complexity of waiver application being analyzed. And we do a, a, a kind of a renewal for those folks as well. And anything that's new that's been brought up, we try to incorporate that into the process. May I make a comment while you're on this slide? Sure. Bob Brock, State of Kansas. Our participation in the UASIPP, the Integration Pilot Program, has brought a great deal of lessons learned about engaging with AFS, all the flight standards, and all the uh, waiver and authorization process of how to get to meaningful outcome and meaningful solution. One thing I'd like to offer to the, to the DAC as perspective is a tremendous number of stakeholders at this table engage in this precise process so routinely to get that waiver or authorization accomplished. The communication that we've enjoyed with this UAS integration pilot program has given us insight and communication channels directly to the people who will say yes, ultimately. The gap that we've identified that's been very powerful to overcome is it's not enough to just simply acknowledge or identify through a data analyst that there's a gap in your application process. Got that. What's been the most powerful is when a flight standards person can tell me here are some solutions other people have engaged that worked well that got them to success. So there's a little bit of a gap between is it okay for the FAA to say, here's how you do it. No proposal to do that. But I think there is some very clear and present value in lessons learned that other applicants or stakeholders have done to get to yes and made it work successfully. So this is both a compliment to UAS IPP and Jay's leadership, but it's also a lessons learned we all need to take as a community. Just getting to know isn't improving and, and, and elevating the entire program. So I think if we really can find those uh, paths to lessons learned or the people who do it well, that's extremely helpful to the others. So just two, and two cents. Thank you. Hey, <clears throat> Bob, that's a great point. Um, and uh, Jay and I were just uh, talking off line here a little bit, one of the, the big goals of the IPP is exactly what you're talking about to get these best practices. But more importantly, and this, um, you know, the legacy aviation folks in the room can attest, and Joe um, in particular, that in the aviation ecosystem, we keep no secrets when it comes to safety best practices. And so um, that's going to be uh, central uh, in my opinion, to the success of this of this uh, industry, is is that we um, both as a, as a regulator and as um, industry uh, share all of these best practices and all of these uh, technologies that um, that allow safety to be continue to be the number one priority throughout the airspace, especially as we get more and more uh, and closer and closer to true integration. To, to go back to Rico's point, um, the support center today is using the lessons learned that we have broadly. Um, and as we codify the lessons learned coming out of the IPP, we're adding that to their, um, to their notes and to their materials as well. But also to Dan's point, I want to point out that the industry-based UAS safety team or UAST is also another place that promoting best practices, uh, particularly safety management, the UAST's provided a safety management system that operators, everyone from a single operator up to, you know, bordering on a 135 type operation can use to help guide them and help. And using those tools and those best practices, we see companies who, or individuals who use those, tend to be more successful in the application process. And those who take advantage of the materials that are out there on our website and the support center um, tend to have more success. The other thing I want to acknowledge is that we realize there are some complex operations people want to do that currently they're 
trying to do under 107. And um, that makes it somewhat difficult to get those complex operations approved under 107. We see some of those complex operations approved in 135s, and that was a bit easier path, but that might be too much for others. So we're, we're currently under the IPP looking at is there a middle ground and can we codify that so that applicants can understand prior to the availability to work to a rule, you know, how could we approach um, a waiver or exemption to another part that would be beyond 107, but maybe not all the way to a 135. Thank you. One of the approaches that this task force took was to look for gaps, and, and uh, both from the industry side and from the, the, uh, the FAA side. And one of the gaps that was very specifically identified uh, by the folks that we talked to in the waiver process that were adjudicating waivers was an, an inability to really use an outside standard to test qualifications of pilots, uh, which I, I just wanted to tag up on one more time because that's going to be super important as we go forward. And um, I, I just note that in the response, and I'm, I'm generally very pleased with the responses, and I thank you for the, the very complete responses. But studying this response is going to be, I mean, we're, we're going to be evolving these pilot qualifications and, you know, as we look at 135, not just what the qualifications of the pilots are, but, you know, the certification process is going to be operation specific. It's going to be platform specific as well as pilot specific. But with regard to waivers for Part 107, industry already saw that gap and stepped into that <clears throat> and, and started leveraging existing aviation principles and, and, and training that was being done uh, by traditional aviators. So uh, I, I would just suggest that, that you know, given that that was a, a, a gap that was identified by the people in the waiver process, how do we test the veracity of a pilot who says, I really know how to do this? The answer is, well, we'll, we'll prove that to us using things that, that are well known in aviation. What kind of training have you got? What, how many hours have you done with this kind of an operation? You see that throughout uh, the recommendations that we made. So I, I just want us to come back to that a little bit. There, you know, we don't have to completely start from scratch on this, and I think industry is willing to s shoulder that burden and provide that training. Thank you. I don't disagree with that at all, and I think part of this from a flight standards perspective is trying to think out of the box because, you know, we're, we're kind of at the Orville and Wilbur stage for this type of thinking. We're, we're doing stuff we haven't done before from that, from that standpoint. So I, I, I completely agree we need to be thinking in different terms as to how we, how we train the UAS pilot and how we, when we get into the UAM business and that type of thing, we're going to have to think differently. There's just no way about it. So. And, and uh, Brian, I think in in uh, Rico's slides, you see evidence of some of that deep thinking by the fact that they're doing research and looking at how can we really do a good job of taking credit for all of those things and making sure that they're doing it in a standardized and unified way rather than a one-off kind of haphazard. So I think you're, the standards out there have really stimulated thinking in flight standards and they're responding to that. If I could just add, too, from, from Alpa's perspective, uh, Brian, really fantastic, what, very well articulated, because that was a question I was going to ask, is uh, Alpa really applauds the amount of thought that went, in, went into this, because when you, you, know, you look at that first slide that talked about um, auto re renewal based on compliance, right, unless there are compliance issues. And how do you make that determination, right? Is it, a, is it after the fact? Is it forensic? Or is it preemptive? And from what I'm seeing so far, there's been some really good thought in here. So I applaud everybody in this room for putting the, for that in. Because when you, when you, I mean, when the analyst, I guess the waiver analyst gets to look at the entire package, right, in making a determination. So some of that's going to be out in the field as a result of some of the inspector's work. That's correct. And I'm curious to look at you know, how the inspectors or how the framework of that inspection process will take place and will it be, you know, mission dependent on the type of uh, operation or it's going to need a lot of flexibility. But. Yep. 
It's a really fine job, though, this task group. Anything else? Thanks for having me. There we go. Uh, could we pull up the comprehensive plan, tasking number four, please? Yeah, this is 30 seconds, and then I need to correct one thing I said before we go on break. Okay, after after, after this 30-second, uh, yeah. so number four is um, the tasking for uh, the comprehensive plan. Um, we've gotten your input on the comprehensive plan. We're working and uh, going through all of the comments, and we thank you for it because um, – it's, uh, it's a large plan, and uh, your comments are um, very thought-provoking, and, and, and uh, we'll get uh, our response to you post-haste. What, what did you say wrong? I confused the two drone-related items on the federal docket. Uh, remote ID, the comment period closes March 2nd. There's a second one around airworthiness and the use of special categories in that policy. And that closes on March 4th, which is what I said. So I was incorrect. Remote ID closes on March 2nd. But please uh, submit your comments. Well, I'd like to say that we were successfully running ahead of schedule. Um, I would like to uh, thank everyone who just presented. I, I think that was a, a, a very helpful in moving the conversation on these critical items forward and hearing the FAA's responses and letting us uh, continue to question them and now al allowing us to work with you on moving these initiatives forward, I think are going to uh, cause us to have some great success as we uh, look to continue ex to expand in these areas. So with that, we're going to go ahead and take a break until 10.30. I'm going to ask that everybody be back here at 10.30 so we can start promptly and we'll then dive into the uh, uh, next uh, sessions around uh, 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 DAC recommendation and uh, taskings. So thank you very much, and we'll resume at 10.30, everyone.